the Lord. We welcome you to another exciting moment in the Redeemed Christian Church of God Sunday School class. We are taking lesson 41 today, the 12th day of June, year 2022. The topic is digital evangelism. Digital evangelism. Shall we pray? Almighty Father, we thank you for the past lessons we have ta you have taught us, which have impacted our lives positively. We pray you will give us more knowledge today. Help us to make use of all available digital and social platforms to evangelize the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we have prayed, amen. We ask ourselves, what is digital? We're talking about electronic technology that generates, stores, and processes data. And then when we look at the other word, evangelism, it is the spreading of the Christian gospel by public speaking or personal witness. So now let's look at our text for today's lesson. It's taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 21 to 24. Hebrews 10, 21 to 24, I read. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Praise the name of the Lord. Our memory verse is taken from the book of 2 Samuel Chapter 14, verse 14. For we must needs die, and are as water split on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Then I doth God respect any person, yet doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. When we look at the statistics that we have, as at January 2020, total world population stood at 7 0.75 billion smartphone mobile users are about 5.19 billion, internet users 4.54 billion, and active social media users 3.80 billion. Statistics also show that every minute about 1 million people log on to Facebook, 3.8 million searches are made on Google, 4.5 million videos are shared on YouTube, and 347,000 users scroll on Instagram. That is huge. The Bible is clear that anyone who has a personal encounter with Jesus is called to be his witness, according to the book of Mark 16, 14 to 15, and Acts 8, 1. I mean, Acts 1, 8, I beg your pardon. With the emergence of new digital technologies and internet and social media platforms, digital evangelism, is an effective means of reaching the world with the gospel. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's look at our first outline. Our first Bible outline is talking about biblical view on digital evangelism. What are the views of the Bible on digital evangelism? Number one is that digital evangelism is the strategic and deliberate use of internet and social media platforms to reach the gospel, to preach the gospel to the world. Number two is that some of these platforms, we already know them. We have them as Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, Telegram, email, and even the text messages that we send to ourselves. Let's now look at the means by which Jesus reached the world with the gospel. Jesus taught people using fishing vessel like we find the reference in Luke 5, 1 to 3. He made use of the vessel of Simon. 
Simon Peter. And from there, he preached the gospel to so many souls. We find also in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, that Jesus went to the top of the mountain even to minister to people with the word of life. When we look at the life of the apostles, how they impacted people with the gospel, we find that Apostle Paul was using his writing. He would write from different places to different people at different locations. We find those ones in Colossians 4, 18, we say, by the epistles. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, and 2 Thessalonians 3, 17. We find that the book of Hebrew was written by Timothy to the Hebrews from Italy. So the apostles, they use writings during their time to reach out to people. Apostle James also, in James 1, 1 to 2, wrote to the 12 tribes of Israel and to the brethren. So they were communicating with people through their writing. When we look at the strategies used by Apostle Paul to win souls to Christ, we find out that first he identified himself as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the gospel to the world, according to Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Number two, he identified with the Gentiles. This is where I've been called to minister to. He identified with them. And then the third one is that Paul's goal was to reach as many people as possible, which he did during his time. We have so many references in the Bible, but I'll take the one of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. Apart from the, this proclamation, he engaged in geographical movement from city to city, from region to region, from province to province. He was not stationary. Again, he located people with the gospel, irrespective of their ethnic, class, culture, or gender affiliations. Then let's look at our second outline. Optim How do we optimize the digital world for evangelism and discipleship? Number one, we know that hostile communities may not be you know, reached by us physically. We can reach these communities through digital evangelism. Number two, our old friends, we can reach them through group WhatsApp uh, platform. The world can also be read through creative visual content. And then we know that these days, online Sunday, Sunday services are in vogue. We can use this kind of uh, medium to reach out to people for evangelism. And we need to know that in summary of all these things that we have said that digital evangelism is cost effective and efficient. And we need to know also that digital evangelism should be incorporated in all the other forms of evangelism that we are used to. The one of one-on-one, -on -one, the one of mass evangelism, or the one that we usually tracks to people. So we cannot say, now that I'm using digital evangelism, I will discuss the other ones. They should all go hand in hand together. We use the digital uh, platform even to, you know, to chat with our friends, to talk about football, to talk about politics. We should channel all these energies that we use for other things, even to push out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the world, because that is what the world needs now. The world is in chaos. So the places we cannot reach to, the digital platform can help us even to get to these people and minister to them. And we, sure, we surely get our reward by making use of this digital evangelism to reach people, because you don't know who will receive that gospel and receive and say, yes, because I read this thing on this platform, I have received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If that person received Christ, you are having your own crown. You are having your own reward added to you. So we should not just be using those platforms that are available unto us for social meetings alone. We should use them to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by so doing, we'll get our reward and God will help us. If we look at our networks, we find that some of them give us social bundles. They're so cheap. We can find social bundle of 50 naira, 100 naira, 115 naira. That with that one, we can use to spread the gospel across. You don't need to spend so much money when you are using digital platform. Sending SMS will cost you just like four naira. 
we can send to as many people as possible. And I pray God Almighty will help us even as we do this in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we want to thank you, we want to bless your holy name because you are a good God. Thank you, Almighty God, for the grace you have given unto us to hear your word one more time today. We commit all our hearts that have had this word into your hands. We pray you will touch us, that we will put into practice what we have learned today in the mighty name of Jesus. And as we do this, we'll have our reward in the name of Jesus. And your name will be glorified. Your kingdom will be expanded on earth in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, ancient of days, because we have prayed and we know that you have answered us. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Somebody praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Coming to your presence today. There's something special in my heart for you. It's a song of praise for you, my maker. I know that you love, love to be praised. And as we sing, you are singing with us, rejoicing over us. We sing.
Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, yeah, dance to the right, dance to the left. Show your God you are grateful. Come on.
Only you can do what no man can do, Jehovah. Only you can do what no man can do, Jehovah. Only you can do what no man can do, Jehovah. Only you can do what no man can do, Jehovah. Only you can open the door that no man can shut, Jehovah. Only you can do what no man can do, Jehovah. Only you can raise who no man can raise, Jehovah. Only you can do what no man can do. towards heaven and declare. Praise the Lord. Let somebody shout hallelujah. We bless the name of the Lord for giving us the opportunity to be alive again and to come into his presence today. 
we, it's another time for us to feed on his table. I want us to lift up our voices unto God this day, to talk to God that even as the word will be coming from our Father in the Lord, that the Geo, that the that the the word will do us good, that the word will transform our lives, that the world will, world will fine tune us, even as we have come into His presence again this day. Shall we pray in the name of Jesus? In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father and our God, eternal rock of ages, the most high God, you are the our Abba Father, the word from the beginning. We are grateful that we are alive again to see this glorious day. We are at your feet again today to feed on your table. Almighty Father, I pray that the word that will be coming forth today will do us good. The word will transform us. The word will fine-tune us in the name of Jesus. We ask, O oh God, for fresh anointing upon our Father in the Lord, even as he speaks the word today. And the word will come from him with power, with grace, and with enablement into the lives of every one of us that will listen. And at the end of everything today, your name alone will be glorified. Thank you, faithful Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Let somebody shout, hallelujah. We appreciate God for today again. And we want to thank the Lord for a father in the Lord that has taken the time to stand before God and to receive from above. We are in another season of the word of God and we are going higher and higher in him. In the book of John chapter 6 verse 63, John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickened it. The flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you their spirit, and their life. We are in the season of the word of God, and the living word of God is solution to generational problems and is a solution to multidimensional challenges. The living word of God in the past has healed and is still healing. In Luke 9, Verse 6 talks about how the word of God can heal. The living word of God brings new beginning in all areas. And as you stand today and as you relax and as you set to for the word of God today, the word will have impact in your life. Are you looking for direction? Because in the journey of life, you need direction. The word of God is about to come. I will call on my daddy in the Lord, daddy here, the boy, to come and give us the word of God. And then Pastor Kunle Ajayi, we usher him to the podium. And I'm believing God from glory to glory, God will take you. God bless you.
Let us pray. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Oh no. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Hallelujah, oh, holy is your name, holy is your name, holy is your name, oh, Lord, Jesus is your name, Jesus is your name, hallelujah, Jesus is your name. Jesus is your name, oh Lord, hallelujah, oh, Jesus is your name, Jesus is your name, Jesus is your name, oh Lord. Father Almighty, the unchangeable changer. Our yesterday, our today, our tomorrow, our all in all, we worship you. We thank you that thus far you have helped us. Thank you that on a daily basis, because of your mercy, you are taking us higher and higher. Father, accept our thanks in Jesus' name. As we go into your word, Lord, today we pray that the power in your word will go forth and bring healings to your children. Amen. Healings physical, Amen. healings mental, Amen. healings material, Amen. healings marital, Amen. healings spiritual. Amen. Let your word bring healings to us, Lord. Amen. At the end of it all, let your name be glorified. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, wave to someone near you and say, good morning, God bless you. We are continuing with our series on going higher. And now we are at part 62. We are looking at First Kings chapter 19, from verse 15 to 17. First Kings 19, from verse 15 to 17, which we have been looking at for a couple of weeks now, but we see have something to learn from it. And the Lord said unto him, that's unto Elijah, go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escaped the sword of Hazael shall say who slay. And him that escaped from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. 
we've been talking about anointing overflowing. But then we've also spoken about anointed swords, etc., etc. But we want to look at one little bit in verse 16 that we have uh, not discussed yet. And that is that Elijah was asked to anoint Elisha. Anoint your replacement. Anoint your legacy. There are certain instincts that the Almighty God had placed in man, powerful instincts. And probably the most powerful of them all is the instinct of preservation. A hunger, a strong drive for preservation. In Genesis chapter 25, from verse 29 to 34, Genesis 25, verse 29 to 34, you read the story of Esau getting hungry and being willing to sell even his birthright for a plate of pottage. I know many of us have rebuked him. We have said all manners of things against him. But you need to note what he said in verse 32 of that passage, Genesis 25. If you read verse 32, he said, of what use is bad right to me if I die? I want to live. I want to be preserved. If I'm not alive, of what use to me is that right? In Judges chapter 15, from verse 14 to 19, Judges 15, 14 to 19, Samson had just gotten a huge victory over the Philistines. With the jawbone of Anas, he had destroyed a thousand of the enemies. And then he became thirsty. And he cried unto God, of what use is victory to me if I die of thirst. Victory is meaningless if I am not preserved. In First Peter chapter 2, verse 2, First Peter chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible says, as newborn babes, we are to desire the sincere milk of the word of God. Why? That we might be preserved. Nobody teaches a child how to eat. Nobody teaches a child how to suck milk. It comes instinctively. The desire to live is strong, very strong in man. It takes a very, very devastating tragedy or situation for a man to say, I will commit suicide. 
It is when somebody had considered everything and see there's no hope anywhere, that's when he can say, well, maybe I better go. There is an instinct called the instinct of self-preservation. Every man has that instinct. That's what keeps us alive. There was this funny incident that happened when they were beginning to test uh, all manners of medicine to combat coronavirus. And we all read that the woman they were testing, that they used the jab upon first, was a woman who was already 101 years old. Yet she wanted to leave. Instinct of self-preservation, very strong. Following almost immediately after the instinct of self-preservation, and uh, by the way, may I uh, pray for you who are listening to me that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, you shall live. Amen. You will not die before your time. Amen. But following immediately after the instinct of self-preservation is the instinct of propagation. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, in the first prayer or blessing that God pronounced on human beings is be fruitful and multiply. You want to reproduce yourself. In Genesis 24, verse 1 to 9, Genesis 24, from verse 1 to 9, Abraham decided to make arrangement for Isaac to get a wife. Why? So that Isaac can be multiplied. Abraham can be propagated. You remember in Genesis 22 from verse 15 to 18, Genesis 22 from verse 15 to 18, God had promised Abraham, in blessing I will bless thee. In multiplying, I will multiply your seed. The instinct to propagate, the instinct to be fruitful, the instinct to multiply yourself is an extremely strong instinct. How strong is it? Genesis chapter 30 from verse 1 to 2. Genesis 30 from verse 1 to 2. When Rachel discovered that it looks as if she wasn't going to get a child, she cried to the husband and said, give me a child or I die. In other words, he says, if I'm not going to be propagated, I better commit suicide. When finally in verses 22 through to 24 of the same Genesis 30, Genesis 30, 22 to 24, when finally God remembered Rachel, and the Almighty God will remember those of you who are trusting him for the fruit of the womb. And she gave birth to the first boy. She said, I will get more. I'm not going to stop with one. That explains the issue of adoption. In Genesis chapter 16 from verse 1 to 2, Genesis 16 from verse 1 to 2, when it appeared to Sarah, 
as if she wasn't going to be able to produce a child herself. She told the husband, let me get a child by proxy. Go in to my maid servant. After all, she's mine. And if she gets a child, that child will be mine. Oh, when you read John chapter 3, verse 16, John 3, verse 16, you will hear the Bible say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why did God so his only begotten Son? This is very deep mystery. But God did that because in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, Romans 8, verse 29, we discover that he did that so that the one he sowed might become the firstborn of many children. So when God has only one begotten son, he decided to adopt more by sowing the one he had. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Romans 8, verse 15 says, tells us, we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Galatians 4, verse 6 says, Because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Every adopted child has equal standing in the sight of God as the one who is begotten. Now, why am I telling you all this? It's because Elijah had no begotten son. He wasn't married. And God is telling him now, go and adopt one. Elijah was the adopted son of Elijah. There is nothing wrong in adoption. As a matter of fact, it agrees completely with the plan of God. If you read Second King chapter 2, and you read it from verse 1 to 12, Second King chapter 2 from verse 1 to 12, you will discover that as Elijah and Elisha were traveling, whenever they go to a place, the sons of the prophet, called sons of the prophets, but they referred to Elijah as master. They came to Elisha and said, do you know God is about to take your master away? And he kept on saying, I know, keep your mouth shut. But by the time you get to from verse, uh, verse 9 to 12 of Second Kings chapter 2, you hear Elisha cry, my father, my father. There is a difference between my master, my master, and my father. So God sent Elijah. Oh, anoint this fellow to be king, anoint that fellow to be king, but go 
and anoint your own son. Go adopt your son and anoint him. That brings us to the issue of legacy. What you leave behind says a lot about you. In Exodus chapter 20 from verse 3 to 6, Exodus 20 from verse 3 to 6, God tells us that when he's reacting to our attitude towards him, he says his reaction will go from children to grandchildren, even to fourth generation. God is interested in who you leave behind. In Genesis 28 from verse 10 to 16, Genesis 28 from verse 10 to 16, when Jacob was running away from Esau and he, he, he had that dream, remember what God said to him in the dream? I am the God of your father, Abraham. He traced him back to Abraham. God is a God of legacy. He is interested in your children. He is interested in your children, children. It is important, therefore, that you take good care of your children. Anoint your legacy. Anoint your future. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9, Deuteronomy 34, verse 9, the Bible says Joshua the son of Nun, biologically, he was the son of Nun. Spiritually, he was the son of Moses, was full of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. Lay your hands on your children. Pass your anointing to them. Joshua failed to anoint his own successor. Judges chapter 21, verse 25. Judges 21, verse 25. Bible says there was no king in Israel, and everybody did as they considered fit because Joshua failed to anoint his legacy. It's a very sad thing that Samuel, as great a prophet as he was, did not anoint his children. As a result, 1 Samuel chapter 8 from verse 1 to 5, 1 Samuel 8, 1 to 5, the elder officer came to him and said, Sir, you are great. You are good. But your children are not like you. Please, therefore, before you die, give us a king. When you study the, the link between Paul and Timothy, you see how serious it is that you should anoint your legacy, your adopted child, because Timothy was also an adopted child of Paul. Paul never married, so he had no biological child. But do you know, if you study the Bible clearly, you will see that Paul wrote two books 
dedicated to his son. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he said unto Timothy, my own son, my own son. Mm-hmm. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, from verse 2 to 6, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2 to 6, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. And then he went on to say, stir up the gifts of God. That is in you by the laying on of my hands. Why must you anoint your son, beloved? Why must you anoint your disciple? Why must you anoint your child? Proverbs 22, verse 6. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, If you train up a child in the way you should go, he won't depart from it when he's grown. Yes, we know not all children will yield to teaching. Proverbs 29, verse 1. Proverbs 29, verse 1 makes it clear. Some of these children will be hard-headed. But your anointing can destroy yokes. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. Isaiah 10, 27. Anointing can destroy yokes. Anointing can break even the hard hearts of children. And the most important thing you need to know is this. When you study the story of the ten virgins, in Matthew 25 from verse 1 to 12, Matthew 25 from verse 1 to 12, you discover that uh, to make it all the way, wisdom alone might not be enough. There might be the need for extra oil. Holiness alone might not be enough. The ten virgins are holy. They are pure, but only those with extra oil made it in. We bring me to the conclusion today. When you read Acts chapter 2 from verse 37 to 39, Acts 2, 37 to 39, you will see the need for your children to be thoroughly born again. Only then can your anointing be of any effect on them. Because Peter told the people, you want the gift of the Holy Spirit? Then first of all, you must repent and be baptized. There's no use putting anointing on someone who is not washed. If you have not taken your bath and you are using the best cream in the world on your body, you will still smell. You must repent. You must be baptized before the anointing can work which is talking to those of you who have been listening, who are not yet a child of God, and you want God's anointing. Repentance is step number one. So if you have not repented, if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, I beg you today, in your own interest, 
Because anointing can destroy yokes. If you want the yokes in your life to be destroyed by anointing, repent. And then seek the nearest gospel church and get baptized. And then the anointing of God can be available to you to destroy every yoke in your life. Let us pray. So if you want to surrender your life to Jesus, why don't you bow your heads wherever you are and cry unto him and tell him, I'm surrendering my life to you today. Please let your blood wash me clean so that I can become a brand new creature in you so that I too might qualify for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so my Father and my God, I'm praying, thanking you for your word. Thank you for the teaching of today. And I'm thanking you especially for those who have decided to surrender their life to you. Father, please receive them. Let your blood wash away their sins. Save their souls. Receive them into the family of God. And Lord God Almighty, let your anointing come upon them. And I pray that each time they cry unto you, you will answer them by fire. And those of us who are already your children, please pour fresh oil on us and give us the grace to anoint our children. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I rejoice with those of you who have given your life to Jesus, just like I've said. As soon as possible, seek out uh, a gospel church. You will find one not too far from you. If you go to any redeemed Christian church of God near you, you can tell the pastor I sent to you that you've just given your life to Jesus. You want to be baptized so that you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I promise you they will help you. Contact me and I'll be praying for you. God bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Praise the Lord. Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, say, be not deceived, brethren. Don't be mocked. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sow, that will he also reap. We want to bring a half free now for us to experience that multiplication we desire. Whatever we don't desire, we don't deserve. And life will not give us what we deserve if we don't place a demand. I want us right away to place a demand on our multiplication. It's not enough to have the instinct of multiplication, but for us to also place a demand on our multiplication. And the best way to place a demand on multiplication is to sow seed. For without sowing the seed, there will be no harvest. Any seed timely sown will give back to a timely harvest. I want us straight away to put our hands to our pocket, even as we sow the seed that will give back to our multiplication, even the journey of life, shall we pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We appreciate you for the great and wonderful things you have taught us through your son, our father, the Lord, the general verse of this great mission. Thank you, Lord, for those instincts he has taught us this day, the instinct of self-preservation and the instinct of multiplication. We are here right now to place a demand on our multiplication by sowing this seed. Your word said, be not deceived, brethren, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sow, that will he also reap. As we place this demand on our multiplication by sowing this seed, may we enter into our realm of bumper abexed in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, King of glory. Thank you, our precious Redeemer, for high pray in Jesus' name. And the account number will be displayed on the screen for those of us who want to give online. And please just follow the instructions, and God will bless you very tremendously in Jesus' name. Bless you.
way now. You say, Hallelujah. What a word. We thank God for the life of our daddy. We appreciate him for the word. God has used him to send to our lives today. It is time for us to pray in order to close the service for today. I want us to thank God for our daddy. I want us to appreciate God for the wisdom of God, divine revelation, strength of God in his life. Let's appreciate God who has used him wonderfully for us this morning again, that our lives will not remain the same. Let's appreciate God. Father, we bless you. Thank you for your son. Thank you for divine revelation. Thank you for the wonderful word you have sent to us. Thank you because we know our families will not remain the same. The same. Our children will be for signs and wonders. Blessed be thy name, Lord Almighty. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Everlasting Redeemer, we want to appreciate you. Our Lord and our King, we worship you for the word of life we have received. Thank you, Lord Almighty, for every family you have blessed with their own biological children. Thank you for those who had adopted children. Lord Almighty, we pray for as many homes who are still looking unto you for their own biological children. As you remember your daughter, Anna, Father, please remember them. As you remember Rachel, Father, please remember them. Let them have their own children in the name of Jesus. Even those who have adopted, we ask, so oh God, by your mercy, you will open the wombs of those women and they will, have, they will carry their own children. In the mighty name of Jesus, everlasting Father, we have been told that as powerful as anointed the man of God, Samuel was. His children, we were told that they did not walk in their ways. Father, in his ways, we commit our children into your hands. We pray that we serve the Lord. They will, they will be useful vessels. They will be mighty vessels. They will be useful in the hand of the Almighty God. They will be battle axes in the hand of the Almighty God. They will be for signs and for wonders. They will be anointed in the name of Jesus. They will serve the God that their Father that we have served in the name of Jesus. Our children will not bring shame to us. Our children will not bring reproach to us in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Everlasting Redeemer, we pray you will strengthen our daddy. You will empower him more and more. King of glory, we ask, O oh God, that revelational knowledge will be on the increase in his life in the name of Jesus. His children will be for signs and wonders. His children will serve you. They will be mighty battles in your hands, in the, but mighty axes. In, the, in your hand, in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen.
首歌。